great to be together and to worship the Lord. Um, for those who um, have read my letter regarding the uh, coronavirus pandemic, um, I'll put a couple of comments down there. I just want to reiterate them. And one is, um, I've watched a lot of the news stations and even the ABC, and a lot of the stuff they say is just exaggerations, fear-mongering, anxiety-inducing. And uh, they're getting doctors who are not specialists in the area. I checked with Dr. David and, and um, um, Sonia. Dr. Sonia. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, seriously, the only people you should listen to are the public health officials, the federal government and state government who specialise in pandemics. Local GPs, local specialists, like ear, nose and throat specialists, don't specialise in those areas. So, so the best thing is not to, to get all worried, but the, the, the actual numbers, that the, uh, the areas of where you should be downloading, I've put in my letter, and that just gives you information. And, uh, and that, they've been, I think, very sensible. The only person you should listen to is the Prime Minister and the Premier. They get the advice from the top officials. So don't listen to all the garbage and criticism and all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, just, just be uh, aware of that. There's a huge amount of anxiety and fear and irrationality about the whole thing. And yet there's genuine concerns. And that's why we've implemented some, some, some things that we need to do. And, uh, one of the best things is wash your hands 500 times a day. <laughs> and, <laughs> and be careful. Um, yeah, so just, just be careful. And, um, um, and again, I think if you know of elderly people who perhaps are vulnerable, who've got, say, heart, lung conditions and stuff like that, keep an eye on them. And uh, because they're the ones that need to that will be, but children and youth and that are, um, are not affected really, they, they get it and, and they say ultimately 80% of people are going to, it's going to be like a common cold and flu, it find its way through. Um, so just be, be careful and wise on that. The other thing that, that is interesting, I was reading a uh, report from three top researchers in Queensland, they're on the verge of actually producing the vaccine. Three of our Aussies, interesting. And um, they're saying they're trying to speed up, not just in being able to, but to also manufacture it very, very quickly so that it's on the market for the world uh, within, say, several months rather than a year and a half. So uh, scientists, researchers, I mean, they're amazing what they do. They specialise in those things. So it'd be good for us to pray that uh, God will uh, provide an answer and believe. So let's stand together and pray and pray for our country and pray for our world. Loving Father, we thank you that you are sovereign, you're in charge, you're in control, and that, Lord, uh, you've given us the ability to create as we uh, look to you. You've made us uh, to be like you in so many ways and to receive creative thoughts and ideas, and we thank you for men and women uh, who are real heroes, who are spending day and night researching, not just medical practitioners, but scientists, researchers. Thank you for these three guys in Queensland, some so young, and yet working 18, 19 hour days for, for weeks now. We pray, give them wisdom, give them ideas, and the other scientists around the world, that they'll crack the code, produce the vaccine, and that this thing will, will, will just uh, be dealt with as it is in all the other pandemics that touch our world. So, Lord, we, we pray for this. And we also pray, Lord, for just uh, people to be calm and for their fears to be dissipated. We pray for our Australian population. We pray, Lord, that at this time, People will look to, to heaven and to realise that you are real and that you provide peace and you provide comfort and encouragement in times of high anxiety. So, Lord, I pray, may we as a church community be filled with faith and confidence and common sense and wisdom and are able to, to impart that to those around about us, neighbours, friends, who may be uh, just struggling at this time. So, Lord, we, we thank you for answering our prayers. We thank you that as the nation prayed during the bushfire time and prayed for rain, that the monsoons came and the drought lifted and the rains poured down. And we pray that the vaccines will come and immunisation will occur throughout the world, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I said to a couple of our golden oldies this morning who were here at the 8.30, I said, um, 
You're here, yeah. You're all okay? No, no, I've got lung problems and heart problems. I've had this and had that in their 80s. So we're not going to stop coming to church. They kind of told me off when I said, when I said what are you doing here? Like, we're here for church. I'm there, okay, I received that. And uh, so people who are old enough to be my parents can do that. You can't do it though. And uh, I'll take it. But uh, I just admired their faith. They said, look, we just, you know, we're being sensible, but we're not, not going to stop coming to church because we need the Lord and we need his word. And we, we're, uh, so I was really encouraged by them and their faith. Praise the Lord. You are called to belong is our theme for today. What on earth am I here for? Hey, I trust that you are enjoying Dr. Rick Warren's What on Earth Am I Here For? The daily readings. We're now in our third week. We've done the week on worship and now we're doing the week on, on fellowship. And so I trust that day by day you're reading it and getting inspired. Hey, look, if you miss a couple of days, don't get the guilts and panic. Go, oh, I failed. No, no, just, just, just go on to the next day. And if you can come back to it when you have an hour to spare, fine, do that. And for our, our life groups, as Pastor Cass said, having people come to Christ through them, that, it's not too late, actually, for you to invite a friend to come along, even though it's been halfway through. Get them to come through, buy the book for them. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to share the good news about, about Christ. And Rick does it so well. So if you're not part of a life group, it's not too late that you can be part of one or bring along a friend who doesn't know Jesus to be, to be part of it. Um, so last week, we talked about how God calls us to be loved by him. And, and, and what a great message that was. What a great theme to know that we are deeply, deeply, deeply loved. We're the apple of his eye. And you know, our response to that is worship. And... Um, that's one of the key purposes of, of, of life, uh, the purpose that God has for us, that we would naturally respond by just saying, thank you, Lord, and living a life of thankfulness and gratitude to him. So what's worship? Is it having a fantastic band like we had that inspires us with terrific music and we lift our hands and Sunday morning, that's it, done my worship, till next week. What about tonight, tomorrow morning? Worship is the response of the human heart in living a life of gratitude for God's goodness and grace and mercies. And, uh, and so we live a life of worship and that just means thank you, Lord. Thank you. I don't know how many times a day uh, I would just say, thank you, Lord. Thanks, God. Praise you, Jesus. Not in some kind of repetitious, inane way, but just thankful for the, the, the blessings that that are upon us and uh, gratitude has kind of gripped my heart and life and thankfulness in recent times probably more than, than, uh, than because of what you go through and the traumas you go through you realise you know what I'm just going to live a life of gratitude and thankfulness that there's so much to give God thanks for not to focus on the negatives of life and, and what you lose and what you don't have but to be thankful that we have him and he loves us deeply. And, and as, as a result, we just say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. It's worship. And that's a key purpose in, in, in life. Today, we want to focus on the second calling on our life. And uh, you've been called to belong to him. And our response, our response is to get intimately connected into the fellowship of his church. And so when you, you know that you're loved by him and you're called, you're called by him to an understanding of who he is. Your response is worship. When you're called to, to belong to him, then it, it evokes a thing of saying, oh, I need to get intimately connected with a bunch of Christ followers in a community of faith so that I, I can really understand my, my purpose in life. And so um, the word, you've got, you've got your little... Uh, hand out there so if you're one of our guests today we've got handouts there and and some of it's filled in some of it's got some empty spaces because as an old teacher I know that 15 minutes into my message some of you are going <gasps> so in this way I'll get your hand moving and you can write something in and so um, 
So if you've got those handouts, you can actually write some stuff. If you need a pen, lift your hand up and one of our trusty ushers will bring one to you within three seconds. Run, guys. <laughs> lift your hand up and grab a pencil and uh, you can fill it in. Yeah, there's some young people in the front here that want it as well. That's great. <laughs> What's today's memory verse? You got your card. Let's look at them on the screen. The three memory verses that we've had so far, Cass shared with us. The very first one, the call is for you. I'm your creator. You're in my care even before you were born. Secondly, you're called to be loved. Give yourself completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. And today's is on fellowship. You were formed for God's family you're members of God's very own family. Say it with me. You are members of God's very own family and you belong to God's household with every other Christian. Wow, that's a great one. Terrific. God is the one who made all things and all things are for his glory, it says in Hebrews 2.10. He wanted to have many children share his glory. How's that? He wanted to have many children. God created the entire universe because he wanted a family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect love, the perfect family, perfect relationship. Their heart to create, one God, three persons, was we want a family. We want lots of, of kids. We want to share this love and this excitement between us. We want to create human beings in our likeness. And so he wants a family and he created us to be his family. He doesn't want his kids to be orphans. He puts them in his family and that family is the church here on earth. So the second purpose of my life is that God formed me for his family. His unchanging plan, Ephesians 1.5, has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. How does he do it? Our first parents decided to break up the family and go their own way and said, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're okay on your own. We want to go on our own. We want to form our own family separate to you. That wasn't the plan from the beginning. And so human beings went their own way and catastrophe followed disillusionment, dysfunction, difficulties, and all kinds of evil, pain and suffering because we're made to be part of his family. So he didn't reject us, even though we rejected him. But his love found a way. That's why we worship. And his love found a way through Jesus. That scripture, Ephesians 1.5, his unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Jesus came lived among us, died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins and our misdeeds. He rose again. He sent the Holy Spirit from heaven and he now says, you can be adopted into the Father's family. The Holy Spirit can come in you, reveal Christ to you. You can be saved for eternity and be safe for eternity. Salvation by God's free unmerited favor. So God's family is called his church. If 1 Timothy 3 says, I am writing to you, he says to Timothy, so that you will know how to live in the family of God. That family is the church of the living God, the support and foundation of the truth. So God formed you for his family and his family is called the church and he wants you to belong to that family. I am called to belong to his church. Look at Ephesians 2.19. So now you are no longer visitors or strangers now you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. You are among those who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ, Romans 1, 6 says. And the word ecclesia, interesting in the Greek word, ecclesia we say it. Anglo say it ecclesia, but I want to teach you the right way. It's called ecclesia. Do you want to say it after me? Ecclesia. Forget this ecclesia business, okay? And literally means a called out people. Our theme is we're called by him. He calls us out of darkness. He calls us out of allegiance to Satan and the dominion of darkness and into his kingdom of light. He puts us together. 
He saves us by his love. We worship him. And he says, now that you believe, I want you to belong to a community of faith, an ecclesia, a called out group. So you've been called out to out of darkness and into the fellowship of, of his family. And he organizes his family into local churches all around the world, like this one. And there are such benefits, guys, in belonging to a local family like the Christian Family Center. Uh, I don't know where I would be. This is my 42nd year being part of this church, and I would be part of the church even if I wasn't the, the senior minister. Uh, the benefits are just fantastic. I just think of my kids. I don't know where my kids would be if it wasn't for, for the, the fellowship of the church. They'd probably be wild because it wasn't <laughs> Kathy and my parenting that was the key in, in raising good kids because kids are kids, you know. They're, they're all born sinners. They're not born saints. And um, that's because I'm a Christian. My wife says, I mean, my kids, my kids are born. They need to identify their sin and repent and turn to Christ at the appropriate age. And I tell you what, the world is pretty tough. The temptations are pretty vicious. And we need the fellowship. They needed their youth leaders. They needed their children's leaders. They needed their, their good friendships within the life and community of the church. And I'm just so thankful. That's just one blessing. I'm so thankful for that. And I see that now with my grandkids. And the world's pretty tough out there. And we need all the love and all the support and all the encouragement to live the right way. So there, there are great benefits. Uh, Jesus designed his church family to meet your deepest needs. And there are various metaphors to describe this amazing community of Christ followers. And in fact, in my book, The Church We Can Be, which I'm sure you've all bought and read, um, the, I use three metaphors, uh, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and the army of Christ. There's other metaphors, and I want to, to, to share some of those today, because they, they describe the uniqueness of this amazing fellowship, this ginonia. The word fellowship, the Greek word ginonia, is one of the most beautiful words in the Greek language. It's more than just communion, taking communion. It actually means sharing participating, contributing, being connected with people, being part of, of a community where, uh, of like-minded people. And so the benefits of belonging, the five metaphors, the first metaphor is that of a family. <laughs> One of the benefits of a healthy family is being taught about your identity. And I'm just so thankful I had fabulous parents wonderful parents, not perfect by any means, but uh, they were terrific and I, I learned my identity as a little Greek boy, though I was born in Australia, though my first language was Greek and uh, I, I knew about my grandparents in Greece, I never met them, they lived and died there, but it's like if they came back from the dead and turned up today, I could start a conversation with Grandpa Bill and my uh, Grandma Carleen and my grandfather Jim and, or Dimitri and my grandmother Valerie because I, I, my parents taught me and my sense of identity was connected into being an Aussie, love being an Aussie, but an Aussie whose parents migrated and uh, who have a heritage and I know all the stories of, of how the Vasilakis name came into being, amazing story. And uh, so when you have a healthy family of origin, your sense of identity becomes a, a, a lot easier to, to understand. But, but sadly today, there's a lot of ill health in families. There's a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot of difficulty. And even my own family, it, it was wonderful. Boy, there was some dysfunction there as well. I don't know any family that's got it all together. And, um, but that's one of the benefits of a healthy family is being taught about your identity. So in God's family, you can write this down. I learn my true identity. Your lasting identity is found, I believe, not the temporal one, because even though my identity is fairly secure on a natural level, and I'm thankful to my parents, they were the vehicle by which I could understand my, my true long-term identity, because I'm only going to live here for a few decades. We're sojourners, we're passing through. You read Hebrews 11, there is a better place, it's heaven but we're going to live forever. And so we need to find our new identity in him. 
and, uh, and where we've got difficulties with our sense of identity in the natural, it gets neutralized when you discover your true identity. And so your lasting identity is found by being in a lovingly connected relationship with Jesus and his family. Ephesians 2.19, you are members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Isn't that fantastic? Wonderful. Wonderful key verse that we're, we're, we're memorizing. Look at Hebrews 2.11, this is interesting. Jesus and the people he makes holy, holy means separate, like the word holy kind of changes us today. So when he makes you holy, it means he's separated you from the old, from the past, and he's brought you into his own very presence. And therefore, you're a separate people. You're a unique people. You're a distinctive people. Jesus and the people he makes distinctive, holy, all belong to the same family. That is why he isn't ashamed. You can underline that word ashamed. He's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to call you his brother and his sister. To struggle with our identity is so very human. For we were folks made for him and there is a huge hole in our hearts that can only be filled by God himself. And I had that huge hole. In spite of having from a fairly stable family, there was a huge hole that that couldn't satisfy me. I needed to find ultimate purpose and fulfillment and meaning and that came through knowing who God our heavenly dad was through faith in his son Jesus Christ and only God can fill it and uh, people struggle with identity as a as a teenager growing up I saw this and when I became a high school teacher I taught for three years and uh, you know, when you're on duty morning recess and afternoon you watch and observe the kids and go man was I like that and I think yeah and you see them kids struggling with their identity so you see the the cool girl and the cool guy and she's up front and she's got a little entourage following her and you look at her and think they've all got their dresses the same height they've all got their hair in a particular way they've all got the same strut you know and the way they talk the way they act and the same with the fellas sad to say I was the leader of the fellas too I had my entourage but I, I led them the wrong way <laughs> I got some regrets back there but I tell you um <laughs> if the truth be told most of your identity comes from your closest relationships for good or bad and so like I'm a son I've got two parents who are in heaven and uh, I, I, I'm, I cannot forget them that's why I wear my dad's wedding ring gave it to him before he died I wear my mum's cross here so every morning when I shower I think of them just for a few moments, oh, yeah. When I go to their grave and I visit it often, mum said to me, you won't forget me, will you, son? And I said, she goes, you'll visit my grave and put flowers. I said, mum, you'll be in heaven, but still you will. Oh, so I better do it if I don't. <laughs> I went there the other day and there were no flowers there. I said, my sisters, what's the matter with you girls? Come on, you should be doing that. It's a girl's job. <laughs> yeah, woke you all up, hey. <laughs> I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I'm a granddad, I'm a brother to three sisters, I'm a pastor, I'm a team member, I'm an employer. They're, these are all relationships that I have and uh, the close relationships that you have um, and for good or bad. So your identity actually develops and is formed that way. But the only permanent relationships that will last forever are in God's redeemed family after we discover our true identity in Jesus Christ. There's nothing that beats the close relationships that we have with one another that we can call ourselves spiritual brothers and spiritual sisters. And, uh, and it says here, he's not ashamed of us. How's that scripture in Hebrews 2.11? not ashamed of you no matter how messed up your life is even now no matter how messed up your life some of your life is really messed up he's not ashamed of you well your life has been messed up my life was so messed up 
He didn't look at us and go, tut, 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 you're a naughty boy. I knew I was a naughty boy. I knew I was doing the wrong thing. But what I saw in him was love and forgiveness and acceptance. And as I, I saw that, it melted my heart. As I saw him hanging on a cross to pay the price for my sin, what, what could it do? But I thought, God, help me to live the kind of life you want me to live. I can't do it in my own strength. I need your Holy Spirit to help me. I thank you for forgiveness, but I need your power to live above the sin impulse, the habits, the addictions that had controlled my life. So he's not ashamed of us. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? Jesus and the people he makes holy, separate, all belong to the same family. That's why he isn't ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Your sin doesn't define you anymore. Don't let your past sins define you. You are new, your new identity is in Jesus Christ. And there are, there's a mark and a symbol of that identity. And, and in societies today, right across the world, there are marks and symbols. And you go to Papua New Guinea and uh, you see a huge number of, of symbols, tattoos on people's faces, their bodies. There's a group in, uh, on the Fly River where the young boys have... Uh, their scales tattooed, not tattooed, they actually cut their flesh to, so they're the crocodile people. And it's just terribly painful. So their back looks like crocodiles. And um, so you see some that have got great holes in their ears, you've got uh, certain tattoo marks and, and it's identifying features. Um, um, I've got a tattoo, do so, you know that? Did I ever show you my tattoo? <laughs> they put it on me when I was 11 to identify me. Do you want to see it? Thanks, Nick. <laughs> now, pardon my, pardon my skinny little arms. I've lost 13 kilos in the last six months, so that I've lost it off. You see that? Bill. So my best friend who was 16, when I was 11, he said, OK, Billy, come over here. It's time for you to get your mark. In case you get lost, you won't know, he won't know who you are. So he grabbed, he grabbed some needles and some Indian ink and a matchstick with a bit of cotton and go come on he goes oh, you're killing me Michael he goes stop being a baby stop being a girly man so I'm it's there forever I was 11 years of age I'm 66 now it's still there so my mum saw it she goes what's that I, go, oh, I just drew put my name on my arm mum then I wore long sleeves for the whole of summer for a whole year, she didn't know. The next year, I wore a short... She says, what is that? And I said, oh, I put my... Come here. And she saw it, and I tell you, I got the biggest thrashing of my life. I still remember it. And when your mother gives you a beating, it's different to your dad. I mean, it's like, what do you do when a girl beats you up? <laughs> never forget that one. She didn't hit me on the head. She gave it to me. She gave it to me on the legs and on the backs, and I've never forgotten it. Don't get your Greek mothers riled up. Boy, they're dangerous. <laughs> hey... Identifying marks. There is an identifying mark and symbol of being in God's family. What is that? It's not a tattoo. It's water baptism. Yeah. It's water baptism. It's the mark that you've said, you know what? I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm a follower of Christ. I, I know what my true identity is. I'm part of his family. And I don't want to have that distinguishing mark on my life. It's your coming of age party. It's your public proclamation. That's why we've got a water baptism tank there. And it's something beautiful. I'd love those folks that have made commitments to Christ already through the campaign. It's Easter Sunday. Wouldn't it be great to have a dozen people baptized in water here? It's saying, hey, I, I belong to the family. I believe in Jesus and I belong. And therefore, if I belong, I'm prepared to publicly proclaim that Christ is my saviour and I'm going to follow him. And water baptism is simply a burial service. It doesn't save you. It's a symbol of the salvation that we've received, but it's a public affirmation. Whereas personal belief can be very private and very personal. But baptism is public where you're saying, you know what? I want to bury that old life. So we stick you under the water just for half a second. That's all. No, it's not going to be for five minutes. Some of you deserve to be under for five minutes, but it's only going to be for a few seconds. And then we lift you up. That's a sign that the old life is dead and buried. We buried dead bodies. 
And the new person rising up says, now I'm a Christian. The Holy Spirit lives within me. And I'm prepared to say, Jesus is my master. I am a follower of Christ. You bring your family, you bring your friends, bring your non-Christian friends. You're declaring who you now are. You're not rejecting them, but you're saying, now I'm a follower of Christ. I love you, mates. I love you guys. But I'm not part of the world system anymore. I'll keep relationship with you, but don't try and evangelize me back into your way of life. I won't do it. The smoking, the drinking, the drugs, the, the chasing girls, the, the criminality, all that stuff's finished. I'm now a Christ follower. Yeah. And you declare that. And so some of you need to get baptized in water. This is the message for you. On your connect card tonight, say, I'm interested. Put it down and say, yep. And one of the pastors, one of the this life group leaders will talk to you. Would love to baptize you. Chat with you, share with you, see where you're at in your journey. The second metaphor God uses to describe the church is a temple or a building. And, uh, and in God's temple or God's building, I am supported by others. Have a look at this scripture. In Christ, the whole building is joined together. Notice that? The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So he's talking about the metaphor of a physical building. But then he says, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. It's like a building that's erected for God's glory. This building, I remember, 1985, 86, it was just bits and pieces everywhere, bits of concrete, some bricks, glasses, they were dumping stuff all over the place and we had to secure it and it was just bits, hundreds of bits everywhere. I thought, whenever, when is this thing going to go up? They put the cement down and I seem like we're waiting forever. I'm there every morning thinking, come on guys, let's get this thing going. You've got to cure the cement, it takes quite a bit of time. But you see, so many parts, but look what it is now. Okay, it's a building. And Paul says, hey, because this is, all these bits and pieces of a building have to fit together. And we individually, we can't belong to God's temple, to God's building, until we are connected together. And as we all fit together, on our own we can't belong. But together we can. So folks, we need each other. We really do. There'll be times in your life when you need other people to hold you together. Look what Romans 1.12 says, I want us to help each other with the faith we have. You have faith. You might say, oh, I'll wait till my faith gets stronger. No, the faith that you have, your faith will help me and my faith will help you. We need identity by being in God's family and we also need stability by being in God's temple because we need one another. Yeah. And that's where the strength comes. When you go to my house you, in, and you look into our lounge area and there's on our stairs, you will see thousands of pieces of Lego. Blue Lego, red Lego, white Lego for the two Lockens boys, Josiah and... And I mean, they're cursed things. <laughs> they're so hard. You ever stepped on it in the middle of the night when you're going to go to the... Oh! Josiah, I told you to put that stuff away. So Kathy said, you don't put them away, you don't play with them anymore. So now they're in three white bags, they're everywhere. And, and you look at them and you think, it's, it's like, they're useless unless you connect them. And you should see what my grandsons can build. I mean, it's awesome what they build. It's like, they build with those, what do you call it, robot things, you know, that are like that. And they go really high and I say, are you sure that's going to not fall over? No, it's okay, Papa. Hey, they're really good engineers. They've actually worked it out. And they build these magnificent things. And you wouldn't get it from this useless little thing on its own. But together, together what we can do. You're God's Lego. God designed you, though, to be connected to other people. That's the only way we can be God's temple, God's building. You're in his family and, and he, you, you are in his, his temple. So he, he wants you to uh, identify, to, to understand your new identity by being in his family, but he also wants you to, to uh, understand that stability comes 
by being connected together. You know, today, the, 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 the curse of our age would have to be loneliness. Man, people are lonely. Incredibly lonely. Right where you live, where you work. Yeah, people can have a smile on their face, but they're, they're lonely deep down. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of relationship fractures and breakdown. There's a lot of in, inner turmoil. And, and the cure, the cure for loneliness is connection. It's relationship. People need to come into a relationship with Jesus and, and where they find their new identity and then they discover they're part of a building. Every part's important to be connected together. The third description of the church in the scripture is that of a body. And in my book, The Church We Can Be, I, I talk a lot about the body. And so I'll just make a couple of comments about this. In Christ's body, you can write this down, I discover my unique value. You could put down there my unique contribution, my unique value and unique contribution. We accomplish together what we could never do on our own, folks. Like a human body, how it works. Every part has a unique role, and when it's in the right place, it makes the body healthy. This is, a, this is different to the temple, connected, stable, this is the body, functionality, living, functioning. We find ourselves anew in the body as we all work together. Many of us, many different parts, quite distinctive and yet working harmoniously together to, as one body. That's how our human bodies work. Every part has a unique role and when it's in the right place, it makes for a healthy body. Look at Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of it and it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have different work to do. So we belong to each other and each of us needs all the others. You need each other. There's work to do. The building's complete, but the body is functioning. It's living it's active, it's, 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 and, and, and it's, to be healthy, every part needs to know its role and, and its functionality. If your foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not the hand, that doesn't make any sense, any, any less part of the body. And if your ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm, I'm only an ear and I'm not an eye, would that make it less a part of the body? Ephesians 4.25, in Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. I learn my identity in Christ's family. I get stability in Christ's temple. I discover my unique value and unique capacity and capabilities in Christ's body. That I'm needed for the body to be healthy. I need to be functioning and serving and giving and contributing. God made us all different. There will never be anyone quite like you. And God loves variety. Just look in the mirror. You're unique. Every morning when you look up, look in the mirror, just say, I'm absolutely unique. There will never be another me. And you've got to come to a place where you like me. If you look in the mirror and say, I don't like this person, you have a need. You need healing. You should be looking in the mirror saying, I like me. I'm happy with me. I don't want to be any other person. My identity is in Christ. I'm happy with who I am. I'm improving. I'm becoming better as I'm getting older. I trust Christian character but, but it's like you're unique you're brilliant you're amazing you're the eye the ear the foot the toenail the appendix or every part is important to make the body work effectively there's no duds in here if you think oh, I'm a dud if you really knew I don't know but God does and he says you're not a dud you're not a dud I love you you're part of my temple and, and now you're part of my body, you're part of my family, and I want you to function, to serve. Even the hurts you have, the pains you carry, God can use for you to bring healing to people. Who are the best people to, to, to bring answers to those who are addicted to some kind of substance or issue? Those who were addicts and who are getting free. I don't understand alcohol addiction, I don't understand heroin addiction, I understand nicotine addiction. I was hooked from 11 to 18 years of age. I couldn't break it. I could break marijuana very easily as soon as I became a Christian. Because they say marijuana is, 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 is not physically addictive. They say it's psychologically addictive. And because I was fairly 
integrated as a person, that dropped off pretty quickly. But the nigger team, pff, I couldn't, took, took the power of God and, 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 and people joining with me in prayer and faith. Uh, nearly a year after I became a Christian, or seven months after I became a Christian. And, um, but, uh, so the best piece, so if you've got a nicotine problem, I, I can relate to you. I have faith to believe that God can set you free from nicotine. Hey, he did it to me, he can do it to you. Let me lay hands on you, not this Sunday. <laughs> Maybe next Sunday. <laughs> See what the Prime Minister says if I can lay hands on people. That's crazy, isn't it? Gosh. But seriously, if you've been sexually abused, some foul deed of molestation, and it's done you in, but in Christ, you're being healed. You're the best person to bring healing to a young man or a young girl or an older man, older woman who's also gone through that. I, I have not, never experienced that. I don't fully understand that. It's almost inconceivable. But I cry and weep with people. But to actually, you've got to walk in other people's shoes. So if, if that's been you, you're part of the body. You need it. If you've gone through a divorce and divorce is hell, there's no happy divorces. Or if you've been a victim of domestic violence, whatever issue, there's, there's lots of pain, lots of suffering. God can use that for you to be a healer and bring health and healing and ministry into people's souls. Wow, so important, so important. The fourth metaphor of the church is of a flock. Yep, I'm going to call you a bunch of sheep today. Don't bar, don't, nobody bar, please. That, that's, I know you wanted to. In God's flock, I receive protection and care. I receive protection and care. So as Christ's family, we learn our identity. As Christ's temple, we learn to support each other. As Christ's body, we learn our unique value and our unique capacities. As Christ's flock, we learn how to band together. You see, sheep have no natural defences. Unlike cows and horses and that, um, even giraffes, you think they're, they're you know, pretty. You ever seen a giraffe kick the living daylights out of a lion? You know, their legs are like tree trunks. The lion gets too close, he just goes kaboom and the lion goes flying. I had a beautiful little calf, loved it. We had cows and horses on our farm and, and then one day the, cow, the calf disappeared and nobody would tell me where it was. Where's my little calf gone? Nobody would say anything and I got suspicious. And I noticed the outdoor, we had an outdoor fridge, a huge one. And it was full of fresh meat. And I said, Dad, and they wouldn't tell, Mum and Dad just lied. They just they didn't have the heart to tell me. They butchered my little calf. They took it to the abattoirs and they were eating it for the next six months. <laughs> I've never forgiven them for that. Oh, I tell you. But you see, my dad, years later, he said, oh, son, he goes, yeah, I didn't tell you because I know it hurt you. He goes, but when it started growing horns, we realised, oh, little Billy's going to get it. And then they noticed him kicking a bit, like as I'm patting him, he's going... He goes, oh, if he gets a bit stronger, if he kicks him. So they did the right thing. Even the little calves can protect themselves from perceived enemies. Even I was a perceived enemy for him if he got a bit annoyed with me. But sheep, no. Nah. They're kind of, uh, uh, they, they, they need to be protected, hear me on this, by shepherds. And as they band close together, you see that. And um, uh, you know, the scripture says this about shepherds. Take care of God's flock, you shepherds. Take care of God's flock, his people, that you're responsible for. Watch over them because you want to, not because you're forced to do it. We've got some fantastic pastors, shepherds in the Christian Family Centre, both here and all across our churches. Wonderful human beings that God calls to be shepherds and, and shepherds you know people think I oh, you know shepherd you know because sheep are 
nice and genteel and that, that shepherds are kind of weak, meek. Uh -uh, not the Bible shepherds, they were tough, rough guys. And uh, they really were. You wouldn't want to mess with shepherds, even shepherds in New Testament days. They carried a big stick for a reason. Anyone came close to hurting their, their sheep, they'd get hurt by them. If a wolf came or a lion came, they, they would fight to protect their sheep. And every so often, if a sheep went astray, they'd give them a little prod. <laughs> so so shepherds, shepherds are tough. Your pastors at the Christian Family Centre are tough men and women. They're not weaklings. They're there to protect you. They're there to teach sound doctrine and make sure that we don't have heretics come on the platform to teach wild, crazy stuff. Why did I tell you about the stupid stuff that's on the media? Because I'm protecting you. I'm getting mad. I'm thinking, man, people are getting hysterical. I've got to say something. I wrote to the whole of the movement, said, pa to CRC pastors, just, just help your people not to panic. Go to the right channels and that. So, so shepherds are leaders. Shepherds are pastors. Shepherds protect the sheep. That's their duty. And I love, look at this verse here. This, this, this verse scares the living daylights out of me. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. That is so easy. For you to obey me, to obey Cass, to obey your pastors, because Philip, that's an easy part. Particularly if we're good guys and good girls and we're not going to ask you to commit crimes or to, you know, break the law or to hurt people. So, I mean, I wouldn't submit to and obey a shepherd that was a crook. I wouldn't obey a shepherd who was going to lead me, off the, lead me up the garden path or over a cliff or who wasn't sackable or was mean and horrible and, and all that stuff. No way. But most shepherds are, are, are good guys, good girls. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. So next time Pastor Cass and Pastor Phil and the other pastors ask you to do something, just say, I've already made up my mind to say yes to them. Don't even think about it, just do it. Why? Because they're trustworthy. Now you can take that to the extreme, I know, you've got to pray and reflect, but I just know they wouldn't be in those roles if I didn't have confidence in them, if our board of elders didn't have confidence in them as leaders. They're sensible, smart, wise, loving people, strong people. Their work is to watch over your souls and they know, get this, this is the part that's scary. Your part's easy, my part is hard. They are accountable to God. What? I've got to give an account to God one day for my shepherding of the Christian Family Centre. I, I can never come to grips with that verse. 42 years I've been doing this. I think, oh, am I doing okay? Lord, help me. Help me, you know, help me in this one. Help me to be a good pastor, a good shepherd to guide and counsel and provide good food and good tucker and, and all that kind of stuff because I know one day I have to give an account to him and all of the pastors have to. And then when you band together, sheep, sheep need shepherds and then they protect themselves as they band together in groups. And it says in Galatians 6 too, Share each other's troubles and problems and in this way obey the law of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, encourage each other and give each other strength. You are not on your own, guys. You have a group of shepherds looking out for you and we all need to know that there is someone protecting and caring for us. Seriously. When I said in my letter... For some of our senior people who can't be at church, we'll take church to them. We're, we're serious about it. Nothing gets up my nose more than in a church when I hear that people that have been attending for 20 years and because they're infirmed and they can't travel and they can no longer come, that they're shut in somewhere and the church doesn't visit them. Now what? At least each week somebody should visit them. Somebody should take communion to them. They can't come to the gathering. We can go to them to care and support when my mum and dad were alive and they were old, I would visit them every day. When my mum had a stroke in 1979 and she was a young woman, lived for 14 years, every day I visited her. I might be for five minutes, just out of respect. Say, hey mum, got a meeting I'm heading to, good to see you. And every time I'd come in, she might just sit on her lap and give me, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm too old for this, I'm going to crush you. But anyway, but deep down, deep down I liked it because she was very affectionate. Dad was a cool customer, mum was very affectionate. So I liked it too, to tell you the truth. But, I, but it's, 
the care of the elderly because they need to see their sons, they need to see their, their friends. Very important. And the sign of, of, of being a civilised Christian community really says, how do we care for the most vulnerable, the elderly, and how do we care for the youngest, really? Those who are most dependent on us. And so um, this is so important. We all need some people to walk into our lives when other people walk out of our lives. We all need people to step up for us at times. And that's why we have pastors, shepherds. That's why we have life groups and under shepherds. The, the life group leaders are shepherds. They're the primary caregivers. The pastors are the, the, the uh, critical care people. And so the first line of pastoral care in the life of the Christian Family Centre is if you belong to a, to a life group, you've got primary care taking place. The larger the church grows, the smaller it must also become. The church must grow larger and smaller at the same time. And that's why life groups are important. And if it's a critical care situation, it requires specialisation, like in the hospital sector. You've got specialist nurses, you've got specialist doctors. That's what I would call the pastors. And who've got particular skills in, in certain areas and trained in certain areas. But... Um, but our life groups, our primary care. So look, we all have to look, look out for each other. Who's looking out for you? Is there somebody that's looking out for you? Are you here, but you're not here? Are you here in body, but you're not here in relationship? Who's looking out for you? Who are you looking out for? <laughs> More importantly. The final description, I'll finish this quickly, is of Jesus' church is that of a garden or a vineyard. So in God's garden, I become productive. And Jesus said this in John 15. He says, a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful apart from me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. See, I become fruitful as I do Jesus' will. A disconnected branch cannot bear fruit. You cut it off, it'll wither. It might last for a little bit of time, but it'll wither away. None of the fruit Christ has for your life will happen unless you're connected into his church, connected to the vine, connected to him and connected to other people. You have five basic needs, guys. You need to know your identity, who I am really. You need to develop stability so you don't get blown away by the tough things in life. You need to increase your capacity and understand your uniqueness and the gifts that you have. You need to have security in your life. Good shepherds band together and you need to become productive and fruitful in your life. All these five are discovered in Christ's family, in Christ's temple, in Christ's body, in Christ's flock and in Christ's garden. Can we stand together as I lead you in a prayer? talked all about worship last week that we're deeply loved by him this week is all about fellowship you're formed for God's family can I challenge you as you're standing here are you just an attender or do you belong what's the difference water baptism will sort you out those who attend are you prepared to say you know what I want to shift from being an attender. I want to belong. I've believed on Jesus, but I, I don't feel like I belong. Get baptized in water. Publicly confess. It's the doorway by which we encourage people to serve. If somebody's not baptized in water, there will be limitations in, in, in what you could do in the life of the church. Because I don't know what's in your heart. I want to hear it from you publicly and say, I love Jesus. I'm following him and I'm prepared to testify for the rest of my life I'm going to be a Christ follower. Come what may, the cross before me, the world behind me. Public affirmation, very important. So are you an attender? I encourage you to start belonging. Choose to get baptised in water. Let us know on your Connect card today. Are you an observer or a participant? Participants join life groups. 
They do life together with other people. They're not scared to participate with other people. It's the way by which you understand what it means to belong. The other thing I see is, I hear people self-talk. People say, oh yeah, I like your church, Bill. And they've been coming for three or four months or a couple of years, I like your church. What's this you like? My church? It ain't my church, it's Jesus' church for a start. And secondly, what's this my rather than our? When I hear people saying, our church, I love our church. You know what's happened? They've become contributors. They start serving. They start giving. They start using their gifts. So is it Bill Vasilakis' church? Is it your, that person's church or is it my church? It becomes my church when you start serving, when you start contributing. You know, like our ushers and our leaders and our coffee people, like Kathy's out there with her team and they've put all scrubbed all those tables uniquely they do it every week anyway like you probably didn't realize that they sanitize everything in the kitchen area but they're doing it specially between the 8 30 and 10 30 service the guys were out there on door handles and and they're, they're serving it's their church it's not my church it's their church they belong to jesus christ you need to become part of this a serving contributing partner with us let's pray together Father, thank you for your wonderful people. Thank you for everybody who's here. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them and help us all to get revived in this, to come alive spiritually and to see that we're deeply loved and that, Lord, you you want us not just to believe and respond in worship but you want us to belong to your forever family and to get connected to belong to participate to serve to contribute and so lord i pray revive us fill us afresh with the holy spirit and power and life that we would be a new testament church reflecting the first church the acts 2 church a loving giving serving contributing community I pray, Lord, help people to take the step of water baptism. I pray, help people, Lord, to not just belong, but also to participate in a life group and to start serving in some area with kids and youth and practical ministries and life groups, serving, contributing. Bless them, I pray. Bless our entire body. And as we're standing in his presence, if you haven't crossed the line to personal faith in Jesus, just give me light, guys. Lift it right up. Everyone, eyes closed. I just want to look at people. If that's you, with nobody else looking around, and you're saying it's time, I want to cross over. I want to cross over to believe on Jesus and to receive him. Will you just look at me? Everyone else got their eyes closed. Just look at me and say, Bill, I, I want, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. In your hearts, just say, yep. Yep, I receive Jesus. Say this prayer after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're God's son. I believe you died on a cross for me. I believe you rose again. I believe you live for me now. Jesus, I now receive you as my savior. Come into my life through the Holy Spirit. Help me to begin anew and to join your family. I ask this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, let us know on the Connect card. And we'll help you. Three people made a commitment during our life groups. You may have people that you're going to invite this week. Or if you want to get baptized in water, let us know on the Connect card. And I trust that uh, together we belong to his forever family. God bless you. You may be seated.